and welcome to GradCast, the official radio and podcast show of the Society of Graduate Students here at the University of Western Ontario. I'll be your host tonight. My name is Yimin Chen, and I'm joined with my co-host. Ariel Frame, that's me. Hey, how are you doing, Ariel? Good. Good, thanks. Excellent. We're all, uh, you know, trying to not get heat stroke during this heat wave, but... Uh, Today we have a um, guest from the biology department, a PhD student. We have Dristi Zeman. Hello. Hi. Very cool to be here. Great. Thanks for coming on the show. So um, if I understand correctly, your work involves legumes. That's perhaps the, the, the broadest, the, the, the topmost level that I understand of what you're doing. Um, and I guess to start with, could you briefly just tell us what are legumes? Because I just think those are beans. Is that true? It is. It is a hundred percent true. It's mostly if you're gonna if you're gonna be very broad spectrum about it, yeah, it's beans, soybeans, fava beans. Um, yeah, mostly it's just beans. Okay. And and what is it about you know beans and legumes that um, interests you and what is it that you study about them? So my research is focused on asparagine metabolism in beans and legumes specifically. So asparagine is one of the amino acids that they that is a form of stored nitrogen in beans. So the reason that my focus is on legumes is because they actually provide so much of the world's protein. They're really easy to grow, especially in countries that have trouble growing foods and crops in soils that can't really sustain other kinds of crops. So I think, I mean, I think soybeans alone account for one third of like the protein that um, legumes provide. And again, they're cheap, they're sustainable to farm. So it's really important in just in terms of a crop that is sustainable, that's healthy, that provides a lot of nutrients. Okay, wow. Um. So now you, you really focused in on, in terms of um, beans and soybeans, um, the, the nitrogen in uh, asparagine. So can you tell us um, wh why do we, why is it important to have nitrogen? When I'm, when I'm eating something, I look for like, I don't know, protein, I guess, or, or fats or the sugars or whatever. I'm looking at carbohydrates. What do we need nitrogen for? So it's less that we as people need nitrogen and more that plants need nitrogen and the other um, element that they need being sulfur. But nitrogen is one of the limiting factors in plant growth. So basically the plant is using it for everything. It's using it to make food, to make other amino acids, to make its own DNA, to propagate growth. So basically it's gonna need that nitrogen to just, you, you need nitrogen to have a healthy plant essentially. So whenever you're talking about anything in crops or agriculture, you're really, really focused on nitrogen and how efficiently it's being used in a plant because that's how you kind of optimize both plant growth and health. I think I've heard of it in like good, good uh, fertilizer, good soil. You've got to look for nitrogen rich. Is that, is that a thing? Yes, it's, it's kind of a thing. And then with like fertilizer, you want to, you want to almost like the goal is to start using less fertilizer and make it so plants can just be more efficient by themselves with using nitrogen. And one of the problems with fertilizer is you use so much of it to fertilize your plants and then you have all this nitrogen runoff and then you have inactive nitrogen in the environment and in the air and that's actually a pollutant. So a lot of the research I think right now in especially genomics and like biochemistry and things like that in crops and like agri the agriculture industry is kind of figuring out oh how can we make you know our crops the food that we eat things like that just more efficient. How do how do plants how are plants able to like eat nitrogen like you put it in the, the fertilizer presumably they need it for a little bit, um, but also then produce it themselves? How do they go about doing that? So they can't, it's less that they produce it themselves and more that they actually just have to get it from the environment. And the easiest way for them to do that is actually just to take it up through the roots. And that's why you put it in the soil. So it's in the soil, the plants take it up through the roots and then they're just incorporating it into other amino acids. So basically you take it up as ammonia and then you're just putting it into different amino acids and other um, 
basically proteins. And then once it's in the plant, basically what you're just doing is cycling the nitrogen through different forms. And asparagine is one of the most important, I mean, uh, giving myself a lot of importance by saying it's one of the most important forms, but it's a pretty important form in that it accumulates at nighttime when plants are not using nitrogen because during the day they're using a lot of nitrogen for photosynthesis and kind of all of the components of photosynthesis but at nighttime they're storing it to use it later on and they're storing it in the form of asparagine so that's basically one of the biggest forms of nitrogen storage in plants. Okay I mean it sounds really important but um, could you tell us a little bit like what what is asparagine and I mean, does it have anything to do with asparagus? Yes, I can. And I knew this question was coming up. I almost wanted to cut it off, but then I was like, no, no, I'll let you ask. I know you want to ask, so you should get to ask. <laughs> so yes, it, so, so asparagine. Sorry. No, it's okay. I've gotten this question, I think, from literally every person I've told that I'm working on asparagine metabolism. So, um, and basically at every conference, everything else. So yes, asparagine is an amino acid. Um, it's a pretty significant amino acid too, because it's one of the five, I believe, amino acids that when you give, so there's a model organism called Arabidopsis thaliana. It's got a very small genome. We know the whole genome and it's basically just a plant. Uh, its common name is thalecress and we just use it, you know, in studies because it is, a, uh, in plant studies because it is a model organism. And if you give Arabidopsis thaliana asparagine, it can survive on just that one amino acid as a nitrogen source for about 21 days, which is pretty cool because usually plants need a whole, um, you know, combination of different nutrients to survive. Um, and yeah, so asparagine is an amino acid. And yes, I believe that it was discovered in asparagus, which is how it got its name. So presumably the legumes that you grow can't uh, just use asparagine as a fuel on their own. That's a novel thing to that other plant that you mentioned. Um, I think that because a lot of plants in terms of how they, especially because nitrogen is so important to them in terms of all of the processes they go through, a lot of their uses and functions and processes are conserved throughout plants. So I think that certain, um, probably a couple of legumes like soybean and um, probably various other plants could also just use uh, asparagine as a single nitrogen source for a while, but it hasn't really been tested because, um, you know, that's not something that we're looking at exactly, but. So what is, what is it exactly that you're looking at in terms of asparagine with, um, with your legumes? So specifically with the legumes is what we've discovered so far is that with asparagine metabolism, when it's early on in the plant development stage, you see in leaves, there's, uh, and I won't go into too much detail, um, won't give them like fancy names or anything, but basically there are two pathways happening that are breaking down asparagine. And one is occurring early on in younger leaves before they've fully developed. And then one is happening in later on in leaves after the leaves have fully developed and more when there's like flowering and actual fruit is being produced. And my focus is on that late stage. So when they've been looking at these two processes, they found that if you actually um, get rid of all of the enzymes and pathways kind of involved in the first uh, process that happens early on in the pathway, that this pathway that happens later on will take over for it. So it's almost an uh, incredibly prominent pathway and it's basically, um, you know, can just process any of the asparagine at any point in the plant life cycle. So my focus is on the second pathway and why is it so prominent and um, you know, like what is the relevance of it in terms of flowering, in terms of nitrogen use and things like that. And more specifically is one of the enzymes in this pathway is unknown. We don't know what it is uh, at all. So that is something that I'm trying to discover. And I think that's pretty novel. I kind of enjoy research where I, I, I think there's a lot to be garnered from research where you're kind of looking at cause and effect of things, but I think I personally enjoy kind of finding more novel things. So yeah, so very broadly, I am trying to find this novel enzyme. It's a dehydrogenase and yeah, that's. Cool, are okay. you gonna, I guess you're gonna be the discoverer, the pioneer. <laughs> yes. Um, 
are you going to name it after yourself or what I, will you name it? I would love to do that. Uh, so I believe that before everybody had a lot of opportunity to name their own enzymes and genes and things like that, that they found with very fun names. And some people kind of went crazy with that. But what started happening was a lot of people would be discovering the same genes or enzymes and then giving them completely different names. And so then when it came to when it came to publishing papers with these different names, people were actually talking about the same genes and enzymes and proteins without knowing that. So now I think there's some sort of, and I mean, I'm not 100% on this body, but it's some sort of enzyme naming or protein naming body that kind of regulates these things. So I don't think there's as much leeway when you're gonna just when you discover something to as to what you can name it. So, and I I found this out early on because obviously as soon as I thought oh I'm gonna discover something I was like oh what am I gonna name it and then I found out I don't have that much sway over that. So that was a bit disappointing. But I have a my question about this this unknown enzyme is. Um, when you say it's unknown, you, you know that there must be something, uh, you know, catalyzing this reaction. But do you, do you know, like, do you have the gene sequence of it or something? Like, like do, do we know where in the genome it is or how big or it is? What do we know? There? What? Yeah, exactly. How do we know yeah. it's there? Yeah. So it's actually, um, and this is one of the things that drew me to this project. It's very interesting because usually when you don't know uh the when you don't know what gene is producing an enzyme you're a look at analogs in other um species and so there are other enzymes in this path in this pathway that we found by looking at the analog in like mammals or yeast and the interesting thing about this pathway is that it does exist in other species. It exists in yeast and mice and humans because you know we all have to process asparagine and this is how it's this is the pathway that it's breaking being broken down in. Um, but and this is very interesting. So in mammals and in humans, we know what the enzyme is that completes the reaction that I'm looking at, but in plants that particular enzyme is either not expressed at all or it's it's expressed so so very minimally that it wouldn't account for the amount of activity you see in that pathway so i know what the dehyd so there there are actually hundreds of different dehydrogenases dehydrogenases are just a class of enzyme and i know which one is completing my reaction that i'm looking at in humans and it's present in um, I'm looking at it in soybean right now and it's present in soybean, but in very minimal amounts that would just not account for the activity. So it's actually like, I, I normally you would look at like a gene, you would do, you know, like a sequence analysis to see, oh, is there something similar in another species? But because I can't do that, I've actually had to take a completely lab-based approach where I'm doing a lot of, um, you know, a lot of very, oh, look at the lab, look at the enzymes in the lab, and then working backwards from that. So when you say you're looking at the enzymes in the lab and then working backwards, it, are you just sort of like taking a snapshot of everything that's in the plant at the time when it's going through these processes and just trying to tease apart all the parts? Or like, could you explain that a bit more? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a little bit. That's very close. It's basically like I have extracted all of the proteins that are soluble in the plant. And then basically I'm looking at different compartments in the plant or in the cell, I suppose, um, and kind of separating up the proteins based on that. And then just based on other parameters until I have separated out enough fractions, basically, that I can test individually with um, the metabolite. So there's one metabolite that I know my enzyme reacts with because that's the metabolite in the pathway that I'm looking at. So basically when I'll do an assay where I have my metabolite, I add just any kind of combination of enzymes. And if I see activity, then I know, okay, my enzyme is there. And then in the lab, what I'm doing is I have a collection of all of the proteins in the plant, and then I'm separating them up into different categories. One of the first categories I separated it into was subcellular fraction. So basically I'm taking all of the proteins in the cytosol and I'm taking all of the proteins in the peroxisome and then I'm testing them separately like, oh, is, um, and those are the two places I assumed based on kind of where the other enzymes in the pathway that my unknown enzyme would be like, oh, it's probably, you know, it's, it, 
the pathway starts in the peroxisome and then carries on into the cytosol. So I'm like, okay, my enzyme is probably either in the peroxisome or in the cytosol. So those are the two fractions I was looking at. And then kind of as you go on, you just keep, it's essentially a matter of like purifying and isolating the protein. So you're just trying to get uh, smaller and smaller collections of protein until you can kind of look at one fraction and be like, okay, there's five proteins in here. Those are maybe the five proteins I'm looking at. So you have like, my understanding of what you just said was that you you know the pathway goes from like a to b to c to d etc and then somewhere in the pathway uh is the the reaction that you're you're looking at let's say it's like c to d and you have some c some pure c and you just put it on you take some protein that you little pieces of protein from the from the plant uh, smaller and smaller amounts like maybe like 100 100 proteins or like five proteins you keep narrowing it down and get, keep giving it C. And if it can convert C to D, then you know your your pro, your enzymes in there. Um, yeah, if, exactly. If, if not, then it then it can't. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly. A, yeah. That's it. It's a it's a good <laughs> hunting game. It's cool. You're you know it's in there. You have you will be able to find it. It's just yeah, a matter of yeah. time, right? Exactly. Well, it's like it's it's, it's good because it's like, you know, once you see the activity, you've got some confidence there that, oh, okay, you know, if my protein weren't in there and because you're using a very specific substrate, you know, if your protein weren't in there, you wouldn't see any activity with that one substrate. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty, like, it's a pretty refined tool, I think. So, so uh, you're looking for just one protein. Is that right? Um, how do you know it's just one and not, you know, perhaps several? You know, I don't, I don't know that actually. So it's like, you know, you just, you have to keep going down the line and you start with every, essentially every soluble protein in the cell. And then you just have to keep eliminating until you get to a certain number. And, you know, it's possible that at the end, I end up with three or four and maybe they're just, you know, different versions of the same protein. So mm -hmm. that's one of those things you just don't know until you kind of, you know, get to a point where you've eliminated enough that you can say for sure you, you said there's like kind of multiple pathways to get to the same place uh different methods of doing like breakdown of proteins is is that a is that like a common um common thing where you kind of have like redundancy in pathways producing different metabolites um i wouldn't say that it's a hundred percent common in that i think that this, this spare gene metabolism pathway is a little bit particular in that it's one specific kind of um, break, like the, the breakdown that's happening is happening in a very specific way in the early plant. And then it just kind of soon switches over. And I don't know if you see that as commonly in terms of like a very specific, like, oh, this is happening. This is changing developmentally in such a stark kind of manner. But definitely there's a lot of redundancy, redundancy in that all of the nutrients in plants and, you know, in ourselves too, they're, they are being cycled. So there's kind of, you know, usually a couple of different ways that um, nutrients are being used up by an organism. So, you know, I uh, just want to uh, broaden out here a little bit and I want to know, are you, what's the life like as a, as a grower of legumes? Uh, are, are you, like, are you done with the growing part and you're just in the lab with the individual proteins or um, are you growing some legumes on the side still? I'm growing some legumes on the side. And I think, um, so it's kind of funny because normally you would be using uh, tissue that you've frozen and you have it ready, but because of the, the, just some of the techniques I'm using in the lab, it's better to use fresh tissue. So I actually have legumes like continuously growing and I'm just collecting their leaves. So it's not as particular as if you were like, um, I think like during my master's, I had to grow um, Arabidopsis, like I mentioned earlier, but I needed their roots and their shoots separately. So then I had to kind of be very delicately collecting like these very tiny roots in very small plants and things like that. Whereas with the, um, with like the, soybean right now I can just go in and like snip some leaves off and that's all good so okay and you know because your your work concerns soybeans um what do you think some of the applications uh, of your research could be in the future like uh if we can understand this process better and you can identify you know some of these 
uh, mystery enzymes um, that are a part of it, oh, how would that have applications to like agriculture, for example? Yes, I definitely think so. So one of the things that we basically are looking at when we're looking at genes and even just enzyme activity is, um, like I mentioned earlier, in in um, regards to like nitrogen use, it's is this the most efficient way to use nitrogen? And as I mentioned earlier, asparagine is a form of nitrogen storage. So if we can understand, you know, what is this uh, protein kind of breaking down asparagine at a steady rate? Is it giving the plant the nitrogen it needs? Then we can kind of manipulate different genes, turn them off, turn them on to see if, you know, we can get more nitrogen for the plant. Like in this case, because it's breaking down asparagine, is it possible that, you know, if we turn off this gene, would there just be more nitrogen storage? Or if we um, make it so this gene is overexpressed. Could we get more asparagine breakdown and just more nitrogen available to the plant? So I think in that way, it's really interesting. And then the other thing to consider is that this pathway is actually occurring later on in plants. So when there's fruit development. So is this a matter of, you know, when we optimize this pathway, are we actually, can we also optimize um, fruit production? So the more beans, basically. Yeah. Are you okay. are you implying that it's possible maybe we could make like a super soybean one day that that's like better than other soybeans that grow? I would love to make a super soybean one day, and I know that um, you know, I know that with like GMOs, people have kind of mixed feelings about it and things like that. With you know what will what kind of effects do you, will are they going to have like later down? But I like um, you know later on in time. But I um kind of a proponent of GMOs. I don't know if one of the earliest, I think, things I read about GMOs was this rice that you could grow in Asian countries where it was extremely flooded. And I thought that was very cool because, you know, that's now feeding like so many people. Like I think discoveries like that are so very important. Um, and before I started working with beans, actually, I, I kind of almost wanted to go into fruit and flowers because I was just like, oh, is there like an apple that I could, you know, create like the most delicious apple or like the nicest looking flower. So yeah, I'm very on top of this, like better than all the other soybean soybean. Mm, yeah. I, I think I'd heard of the, I think it's the golden rice. That's the one that the, yes. that was yeah. modified and it, it's like, you know, saved a lot of people from hunger. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's a noble avenue to go about. Uh, is that, uh, I guess that begs the question, you know, what, what kind of got you here? I mean, it sounds like you were looking to make a super something, um, but is was that your general goal? Um, why uh, why study this? Um, well, it's like a bit of a path for me. Not that much of a path. There wasn't that much deviation. Um, but I uh, watched Jurassic Park too early in life, so like. Uh, yeah, so very early on, I was um, very fascinated with, I think, and I don't, I don't want to get too much into it, but just, you know, the kind of power of like creating things, which I thought was very interesting, which got me into genetics. And so a lot of my background is actually in genetics. And for a long time, it was kind of in human genetics. And I'll be honest, um, I think around third year, I took a genetic engineering course, which I was very excited about because I thought it would be about, you know, like human genomics. And then it ended up being about all of plant genomics. And that was actually super disappointing for me. So I think for me, it's like, once I found out how um, far back we are kind of in terms of human uh, genetic engineering and things like that, and the timeline for those things being allowed, I was like, okay, well, I just really wanna be able to manipulate some, you know, foundations of life. And we're doing that in plants all the time. So I'm like, all right, here, we'll do that instead. So I kind of just slipped into that and yeah, that's kind of, and then I have a lot of background in genomics and I like to pick up a lot of skills. So now I'm kind of more in like a biochemistry thing, but now I think I've, I've kind of like, you know, got it covered. I've worked with RNA, DNA and protein, like basically kind of got that whole tree so, down. So can you see yourself working with soybeans for the rest of your life or now you've got these skills that you've learned during your PhD and you want to like apply them somewhere else 
I would not mind working with plants, but yeah, I think all of the scales, I mean, especially because you're, you know, working with uh, things like DNA, RNA that are very, very, I mean, similar across species and the way you handle them and the techniques you use. So I think I would want to stay in plants um, because the other reason is I don't love handling lab animals. Um, so I, I and, and I feel like they're a lot more upkeep than just plants that, you know, a technician can water for you. So I think I would like to stay in plants, but I'm not particular about which plants because I think a lot of you know, different plants have their own kind of merits. Before this, I worked in canola, which was, which is one of Canada's like biggest exports. So, um, canola, canola. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are these, like, I mean, I guess like you mentioned the, the convenience piece, you know, your, your, your plants can't get away like an animal. You have to say, Hey, come here <laughs> and, and contain them in some sort of way. But oh, uh, yeah. it makes me wonder, I mean, are there differences in in convenience for different plants? So, are how big are soybeans and canola plants? And, and I don't know. Apple trees are pretty big. If you were going to make a super apple, you'd probably get a, need a huge tree, right? That's true. Yeah, I think it's yeah. Anything that you're going to have to wait a long time to grow is less convenient. And then things beans kind of have a lifespan of like you know beans or Arabidopsis, things like that. Canola even about like three to four months is their whole life cycle. So it's pretty convenient to work with those. And I would, um, you know, a thousand percent rather wait like a couple of months than work with Drosophila because I've seen like the Drosophila rooms that people have where they like breed them and I'm like no I, I can't do that so you know I, I think it's really interesting that you cite Jurassic Park as one of your inspirations uh, for getting into this line of research and you know one of the takeaways from that film is the idea that um, you know the, the scientists were so concerned with whether or not they could they didn't Stop to think about whether or not they should. Do do you ever think about that in in, in your um, research? What you're doing? I I I think about ignoring it all the time. Yeah, but I think that the other thing about that is it was more. I feel like a lot of like that was less about you know like should science do it and a lot more about like oh capitalism is bad and we shouldn't you know like. Um, you, we shouldn't use science to like exploit, you know, kind of our resources and things that we're doing with that. So yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess to answer your question, I don't know that I would ever become evil fully, but like. But you could just see yourself as like a cog in the machine of evil potentially. Is that um, I feel like we could all potentially be cogs in a machine for evil and not know about it, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't lay it at your feet, even if you, yeah, you yeah. know, you made this, let's say you make your super apple and everyone's like, it's fantastic. But then like, I don't know, it, it, it overwhelms the the world of apples. And now we have no other apples or something. And that affects the who knows where it could go. Right. But that's not your intention. And, and we can see that if we anticipate those things, just like if they had anticipated that, like, look, you're not going to be able to contain dinosaurs, like don't bring people there, just make it a environmental thing you leave them on the island and ensure that they can't get away and how you can observe them for science and don't don't bring people there and get them to pay for it then maybe yeah. they've avoided everything that was the jurassic park tragedies and stuff and yeah, exactly. the same thing. yeah yeah and it's like you know if i made this uncontainable apple then like like you said it's you know i didn't propagate it it's you know there are so many pieces and people at play I mean, someone is profiting off of my apple more than I am, probably almost guaranteed. So, <laughs> so it's not uh, the science that's evil, it's the people. It's the people. In the end, who are the real monsters? It's the businesses. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's um, yeah, thought. We're uh we're almost out of time here. You know, I, I think that your story is a really cool one, a good path. Uh, I'm excited to see where you go. I'm excited to see what sort of super plant you make one of these days um what advice can you give to somebody else another um student undergrad a, a kid watching uh jurassic park what advice can you give to them if they want to go a similar path to you um oh i don't know if i'm in any position to give anyone any advice but uh i think something that really motivates me that might be nice to hear is that 
and I don't know how any other way to phrase this other than there are like there are things that you think are just immutable things you think you can't change but like you can change those things like we have <laughs> we have the technology and you know we have the know-how and I think there are a lot of things that people think are very complicated but they're actually not that complicated like <laughs> like and I don't and I don't really even think things that I'm doing are very complicated or difficult. I'm just like, anybody could do this. I legitimately think if you took a little bit of time, you could do this. So like, I don't think, it, don't, like nobody should ever think that there's something that they just not are not smart enough to do basically. Wow, excellent words of wisdom to leave, uh -huh. leave us on. So thank you so much for coming on, Drifty. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. With that, this has been GradCast the official radio show and podcast of the Society of Graduate Students here at Western University. I've been your host, Ariel Frame, with my co-host, Yimin Chen. We've been speaking with Dristi Zaman from the biology department. Uh, this episode, I will also be producing, so I'm producer as well. And uh, if you want to get involved in the show, you want to you know, be where I'm sitting or be where Dristi was sitting today and come on the show, uh, email us at gradcastradio at gmail.com. Um, we're on the social medias all over the place, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at Gradcast Radio, and uh, uh, you can contact us there. Um, if you want to listen to some of our archived episodes, uh, they're available on our website, gradcast.ca, and we're also on the radio, uh, Radio Western, 94.9 FM, um, every week. Um, if Yeah, I guess the, the best place to find us is uh, on any podcast app. We're available there as well. And uh, select episodes are also available on YouTube in video format um, under Gradcast Radio. That's all for today. Thanks for listening. Bye.